Good day. A few days ago, I did a programme for this channel in which I discussed the deployment by Britain of Britain's aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth to the South China Sea. This deployment took place against a backdrop of a series of provocative articles. There were, in fact, two of them by the Anglo-American journalist Tom Rogan in uh, Washington Examiner, a, an American publication, in which Tom Rogan basically goaded the British to uh, provoke the Chinese or challenge the Chinese by sailing HMS Queen Elizabeth within the 12-mile um, exclusive zone claimed by China in the disputed areas of the South China Sea around certain artificial reefs and islands which have been constructed by China to enforce its claims there. I said in that video that Tom Rogan's um, goading of Britain in this way was reckless and irresponsible and entirely misconceived. It was putting British lives at risk for a geopolitical objective that was um, not in Britain's interests to pursue, given that Britain is not part of the Pacific region, and also given that the British Navy, the Royal Navy, has only a minor contribution to make to the titanic struggle for power and influence that is now being waged in the Pacific between the two great Pacific superpowers, the United States and China. And moreover, and in addition, as I also discussed in that video, the Chinese themselves took an exceptionally strong line about the British deployments. There were a series of strong articles in the Chinese media, and I read out in full an article by Global Times um, in which the British were warned that if their, their ships sailed anywhere close to territories claimed by China or artificial islands created by China or into Chinese territorial waters or waters claimed by China, then the British might suffer extremely unpleasant consequences. And I would add that those articles which appeared in the Chinese media were eventually backed by official statements by the Chinese government itself by the Chinese defence and foreign ministries. Well, I'm glad to say that the British on this occasion seem to have heeded the advice they were being given by China and that wiser councils appear to have prevailed in London. I understand that HMS Queen Elizabeth has now left the area and in the meantime... And before this, on Friday, there was an article in the Guardian newspaper in Britain in which, uh, based on uh, sources within the British Defence Ministry, uh, the Guardian uh, um, said that the British were not looking for a confrontation with China in this, uh, in this region. And I'm going to quickly read extracts from this article. It's not very long, but it does give a sense of what the British are saying, and it was clearly intended as much to be read in Beijing as it was intended for a British audience. And here's what the article says. Britain has said it has no plans to stage a naval confrontation with China in the South China Sea, and that it aims to send its carrier strike group in the most direct route across the contested body of water from Singapore to the Philippine Sea. The cooling message emerged hours after China's military and state media warned the United Kingdom against provocation as the group, led by Royal Navy aircraft carrier Queen Elizabeth, undertakes what had been expected to be a more assertive deployment. British defence sources said HMS Queen Elizabeth would sail tens of miles away from the disputed Spratly and Paracel Islands, which are claimed by China, 
The aircraft carrier and allied ships entered the South China Sea earlier this week and are expected to leave by the end of Saturday. It is understood there is no intention to repeat the decision to sail the HMS Defender through disputed waters off the coast of Crimea in June, which led to the warship being followed by the Russian Coast Guard and being buzzed by low-flying planes. Instead, the Queen Elizabeth and its support ships will go on to take part in exercises with the United States, Australia, France and Japan in the Philippine Sea in a multinational show of strength aimed at Beijing. Well, as I said, wiser councils have prevailed and I am going to make a guess that one reason why those wiser councils prevailed was not just the uh, warnings, the very strong and clear warnings from China, but the complete lack of enthusiasm for any confrontation between Britain and China, which was coming flowing out of the government of the United States. And the key person to follow in this is uh, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin, who made his lack of enthusiasm for any uh, confrontation between Britain and China crystal clear over the course of a press conference he gave in Singapore um, whilst in the middle of a um, Asian tour, which he is currently undertaking. Now, over the course of this uh, press conference, he was asked about uh, the British naval deployments and he made these words. We are, we, the uh, UK and the United States, are global nations with global interests. And so as we look to balance our efforts in various parts of the world, we are not only looking to help each other in the Indo-Pacific, but we are looking to ensure that we help each other in other parts of the world. As well as if, for example, we focus a bit more here and there, and there are areas that the UK can be more helpful in other parts of the world. And I have a great relationship with the UK MOD, and these are discussions that we've had a number of times. And again, it's a balancing act. Resources are scarce, no matter which country you're talking about. And again, we have interests around the world, and we want to make sure that we work together to address all of those interests. So what General Austin is saying, and one of course has to unpack his words rather carefully, is that the British can do very little in the South China Sea or, and in the Indo-Pacific, but they're more useful to the United States in other places. Now, he does, didn't say which other places, but it's quite obvious that what, he refer, what he's referring to is the NATO area, the North Atlantic, the uh, places much closer to Britain itself. And, of course, he is right. And what the United States, what the US Defence Secretary about this is entirely pertinent and because of an interesting fact about HMS Queen Elizabeth and her task force. And that is that this task force that is steaming through the Pacific with HMS Queen Elizabeth at its head, in fact, is not a British task force at all. HMS Queen Elizabeth leads it, British uh, other British ships are part of it, but a considerable part of this task force and part of the carrier air group that is a um, that is based on HMS Queen Elizabeth itself come from other nations, first and foremost from the United States. And we learn this from USNI News, which reads as follows. 
Queen Elizabeth and its remaining surface escorts conducted a Passex exercise on the 25th local time in the Malacca Strait, Strait with the Royal Malaysian Navy's two Lekyu class frigates KD Lekyu and KD Jebat, both ships having been built in the UK by Maro, Yarrow uh, shipbuilders. Um, um, AIS data shows Fort Victoria travelling down the Malacca Straits in a distance ahead of the group comprising of Kent, the Sullivans and Evertson with Queen Elizabeth closely behind the three escorts and the US UK carrier strike group includes 20 type British type 23 anti-submarine frigates HMS Richmond and HMS Kent, type for British Type 45 guided missile destroyer HMS Defender, Royal Fleet Auxiliary uh, uh, Fort Victoria and uh, Tidespring, US destroyer USS The Sullivans, Dutch frigate uh, Evertson, and the nuclear attack submarine boat HMS Artful. U.S. Marine Corps Fighter Attack Squadron um, is embarked in the air group along with the Royal Air Force's 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters. So this is a mixed group. It includes British, Dutch and U.S. warships and the carrier group actually deployed on HMS Queen Elizabeth includes a unit from a, an Air Force unit from Britain's Royal Air Force and it also includes a US Marine Corps fighter attack squadron all of which operate from HMS Queen Elizabeth. In other words the Americans have a direct say on what Queen Elizabeth does and where it is deployed because it is their, their aircraft and their warships, which are also deployed as part of this carrier strike group. So when Tom Rogan writes about the British sailing HMS Queen Elizabeth into the territorial waters claimed by China, perhaps he doesn't realise that he's not just risking British lives, he's also risking American and Dutch lives also. So, H, uh, so Lloyd Austin is in effect in a position to tell the British Defence Ministry where he wants HMS Queen Elizabeth to go. And quite obviously, he does not want it to go in areas close to the, uh, the islands and reefs uh, claimed by China or into the territorial waters of the South China Sea also claimed by China, at a time when the Chinese are making threats of action if HMS Queen Elizabeth does anything so reckless. So it is in fact the Americans who made clear their lack of enthusiasm for this idea and the British have had to comply. And we have to ask ourselves a question in light of this, in light of the fact that this carrier task group that the British are deploying to the South China Sea, to the Pacific, consists not principally, but at least partly, of American warships and of American aircraft. What exactly is HMS Queen Elizabeth doing there? We see how Lloyd Austin is basically telling the British we don't really want you in the South China Sea. We don't really want you in the Pacific. Resources are stretched. We want you to deploy and to stay in places closer to home in the North Atlantic and places like that where you can really make a difference. So given that that's the American view, why are the British sending their warship into the Pacific to challenge the dragon close to the dragon's den to poke the dragon in the seas that China itself um, uh, claims and to do so in a way that the Americans don't want and which has forced the British 
essentially to beat a, a retreat with their, t with their tail between their legs. Well, there's been a coruscating article about all of this by the brilliant British international affairs commentator Anatole Levin. It's on responsible statecraft. And I'm going to read again extracts from it. And this is what he said, and it is written on the same day as that article appeared in The Guardian. Some of Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin's remarks in Singapore are, uh, are, are a, a severe embarrassment to the British government. Whether uh, Austin realised this or not, he undermined one part of Biden administration strategy with regard to Europe and China when he said, if we focus a bit more on Asia, are there areas where Britain can be more helpful in other parts of the world? Austin's statement is an implicit recognition that the British carrier group dispatched to the Indo-Pacific does very little in practical terms to strengthen US forces against China. The purely symbolic warships dispatched by European NATO members to the region do even less, which is to say nothing at all. On the other hand, as Austin suggested, Europe is facing challenges closer to home where Britain could play a more useful role and Europe could relieve the United States of some of its present commitments. British and European calculations in making gestures of support in the Indo-Pacific are different. For the British establishment, it is part of their continuing desire to be seen as playing the role of a great power on the world stage without bankrupting Britain in the process. This can only be done on the shoulders of the United States. This desire has become an obsession on the part of the Johnson government because of their promises that as a result of leaving the EU, Britain would regain the freedom and independence to become great again. Paradoxically, this, in but inevitably, this desire for independence has in fact led to even greater dependence on the United States. Yet the crazy thing, as hinted at in Austin's remarks and stated explicitly by President Obama and his administration, is that members of the establishment in Washington never wanted Britain to leave the EU. This is not just because they regarded Britain as a channel for American influence within the EU, but because within Europe, Britain can make a real military contribution, not due to the strength of its forces, but because Britain, together with France, has one of the only two armies that is actually willing to fight. The strategy of the other European members of NATO is to avoid serious warfare and the cost of creating effective armed forces and to leave responsibility for the defence of Europe in the hands of the United States. To this end, however, they give the minimum help necessary to make sure that the United States maintains that commitment to Europe and they do not have to take responsibility themselves. As German officials admitted to me in the past, Germany could not be relied on even to send troops to fight in the Balkans should another war break out between Serbia and her neighbours. From the US point of view, this is a fool's bargain. US European military help to America is almost insignificant compared to American military help to Europe, which is why the United States needs Britain and France to deploy their forces in Europe. Well, um, Anatole Levin has put it exactly right. And that is the lesson the British need to learn. The Americans do not want them cluttering up the situation 
in the Pacific. They certainly do not want the British creating trouble between the United States and China at a time when the United States might not be ready for might not be ready to deal with it. Certainly, and above all, the United States does not want to be put into a position where it has to ride to the rescue of the British because of irresponsible behaviour on the part of the London government, which is unwanted by the United States. So it is far more sensible and far more wise for the British to remain deployed in their own region in the North Atlantic than it is for them to go gallivanting around the world, seeking adventures in all sorts of places like the South China Sea and indeed the Black Sea, where they have no business to be. Now, I'm going to say something else. Um, um, Anatole Levin is absolutely right that part of this uh, drive, this obsession on the part of the Johnson government, and it's not only... Uh, shared by Johnson, it's shared by other members of the government too, to try to assert a global role for Britain flows from a desire to uh, um, emphasise that Britain has returned as a great global power following Brexit. But British opinion as a whole, including pro-Brexit opinion, is not interested in these adventures. It is not going to win the Conservative Party any votes in the heartland areas which voted so heavily Conservative in the December 2019 election because of Brexit, because Britain is sailing a warship in the South China Sea. People in places like Hartlepool, where um, um, the Conservatives just won an important by-election, are not interested in what is going on in the South China Sea, and they will not be happy if they find out that the British government is recklessly and irresponsibly putting British lives in danger. If Britain gets into serious trouble in in a place like the South China Sea, then not only will that not go down well in Hartlepool, it will make voters in Hartlepool and other such places, extremely angry, especially if Britain then has to turn to the United States for help and if the United States has to come to Britain's rescue. At that point, those voters will not be proud that Britain is playing a global role. They will, on the contrary, be incensed and angry that British lives have been put at risk and perhaps have even been lost and that Britain has been humiliated. And it is a point to make, which is that Remainer opinion, the anti-Brexit, anti-Johnson establishment in Britain sees things in exactly the same way. Far from being impressed by this kind of um, um, deployment, they are actually um, they are actually uh, reveling in what they see as the delusional policies that the British are pursuing. You can see that by reading a editorial in the militantly anti-Brexit and anti-conservative Observer. Published a, uh, published a few days after that Guardian article, which refers to the whole uh, deployment in the South China Sea as foolish and near-imperial fantasy and one which uh, could go disastrously wrong. So, let us leave these adventures in places like the Black Sea and the South China Sea behind us. This is not what Brexit was ever about. It's about sorting out the various problems that have accumulated in Britain over the last 40 years, some of which, though perhaps not all of which, 
can be attributed in some way to our relationship to the European Union. And let us leave the contests of the great powers to the great powers, realistically acknowledging the fact that we are not one. And as for the Chinese, well, they can congratulate themselves that they have managed yet again to tell the British Bulldog to go back into its kennel. And they have had the pleasure of seeing the, Brit seeing the British Bulldog do just that. Thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on this channel. Please also join me for um, other programmes, which I do with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou, on our main channel, The Duran. Please also um, remember to check out Alex's channel. You'll find links under this video. And please also go to our, uh, uh, check us out on our other platforms, BitChute, Super U, and especially Locals. We ask you to sign up on Locals. We are doing great many things. We're planning great many things for our channel, for our uh, on Locals. And we'll have exclusive content there, um, which you would, I think, particularly want to see. Also, please help us to the extent that you feel you can by backing us through PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar. Any donations you feel you can make are very gratefully received. And don't forget to check out our shop and find the amazing things that we have there. Our amazing hats, uh, Durand shirts, uh, mugs, uh, uh, um, sweatshirts, hoodies and all the rest. And last but not least, please remember to press the like button if you've liked this video and also please check your subscription to this channel um, if you are subscribed to it and please subscribe to this channel if you are not. And thank you for joining me today and I look forward to you joining me again in future programmes and have a wonderful day until then.